So conservation in situ means conserving species in their natural habitat and involves minimising human impact. So here we have some wildebeest and again the wildebeest hordes in Tanzania and we've got a rhino and we've got a lion. And all of these photographs are taken in the Serengeti National Park. So here we have some Hartman zebra again. You may remember this photograph from a previous video. And what we really need to make sure we understand is that conservation is a term we use a lot. But what does it actually mean? First of all, it's important to appreciate that conservation is an active process. It requires active management. It doesn't just mean leaving things to get on with their own devices. It's active because it requires humans to maintain habitats, to help the species that live there to continue to survive. And the whole purpose of carrying out this conservation is to protect those species that are endangered, that are very, very close to becoming extinct. So when we talk about conservation in situ, we're talking about conserving the animals in their natural habitat, but minimising human impact, although appreciating that humans are necessary to help to manage the environment, to maintain the habitats and the species and continue to protect those that are endangered. So if you find yourself in a position where you want to set up a wildlife reserve, um, and here there's pictures around about these are taken in the Gorongoro Greater in Tanzania. There are three very important questions that you need to address if you are going to set up a wildlife reserve. The first of these is around comprehensiveness. Now, by comprehensiveness, we mean how many species are represented in the area and what are the environmental conditions like. And if you think, yes, there's lots of species and the environmental conditions are good, then you can tick that um, question off and go on to the second question, which is adequacy. Now, for adequacy, what we are doing is asking ourselves, is the area large enough? Is it large enough to provide for the long term survival of all the species and all the populations and all the communities present? And if you can answer yes to that question as well, it's a big enough area, then you can move on to the third question, which is representativeness. By representativeness, we mean in this particular area, is there a full range of diversity within each species and each set of environmental conditions? And if you can answer yes to that and the previous two questions, then you're saying, yes, this is a good spot, a good area to set up a wildlife reserve. Now, when you're doing this, there's something very important you must not forget, and that is the relationship between the people setting up the reserve and the needs of the indigenous people. And these are the local people that have lived in this area for generations. Because they will have used the area for traditional hunting. They will have spiritual and religious activities which traditionally have taken place in that area. And these must not be overlooked. And there may be conflicts. Now, there may be conflicts with local people in that the local people will find perhaps that some of the animals will leave the reserve and raid their crops. And elephants are particularly notorious for doing that. They trample the crops, they strip the bark off trees and can be quite a hazard. But in addition, there is also poaching. Now, poaching, if you think in terms of the local people's point of view, they may have always used the area for hunting. Now, because it's a protected reserve, if they hunt on that area, it is poaching. And that is illegal. And illegal timber harvesting is another problem for the same reason. But the local people are educated. The local people have been told they 
have been asked to comply with the rules and regulations. So if they still um, continue to poach and illegally, illegally um, harvest the timber, then it is not because they haven't been given the information. But the th last point here is tourists. And tourists, when they visit these sites, are given very strict rules and regulations of what they can and cannot do. They certainly shouldn't leave litter. They certainly should not feed animals. These are dangerous wild animals. We are not at the zoo here. This photograph of the elephant, this is a bull elephant. I took that photograph. Over here on the left, that's me. I got very close to this elephant. Um, very enthusiastic elephant fan. I got very, very close and he turned. And in the photograph that I captured, you can see his ears are out. And that was when he saw me. He put his ears out. He's warning me, do not come any closer. So I took my photo and then I walked very quickly backwards. So what about wildlife reserves in the UK then? Well, in the United Kingdom, we have got national parks, 15 of them. And if we look at this map here, and I just make it a bit bigger, um, you can see in red where these different national parks are to be found. So the nearest one here really is the Brecon Beacons, but that's my part of the world, Pembrokeshire Coastal Path. Some of you may have been there on holiday. Um, but you can see there's lots of different ones scattered around all parts of the country, Lake District, Peak District, right up to the Cairngorms in Scotland. So there's a lot of national parks which we can enjoy. Usually um, they are made national parks because they're beautiful, they're aesthetically pleasing, there's lots of different species growing there. But in addition, um, we also have national nature reserves, or known as the NNRs. Um, there are about 400 of these in the UK, and they're set up to protect sensitive features. Um, and they cover all types of vegetation, from peat bogs um, to forests, to wetlands, to rivers and streams. Um, then you have sites of special scientific interest or the SSSIs. 6,000 or so of these in the UK. Um, they do change on an annual basis um, and they include some of the most spectacular habitats in this country. This then um, leads us to actually think about something uh, more local. Um, we've got 121 SSSIs in Gloucestershire, including um, Crickley Hill, which I'm sure you all um, know where that is. And in addition to that, we also have local nature reserves. Now, these are run by county wildlife trusts. And again, there's one very close to school in Badgeworth, um, where we have the Badgeworth Buttercup. Only comes into bloom uh, one time of the year, sort of um, around about May time now. So it's um, in bloom now. And um, people are allowed in small numbers to go and visit that area. Then finally, we have marine conservation zones. And marine conservation zones, as you can no doubt guess, involve water. Hence the background here is in blue. And there are about 27 sites in the UK protecting rare, threatened and representative species. And let's have um, a closer look at that. So we've got here, oops, it's a bit fuzzy, make it a bit smaller. Um, we've got here um, three different colours, three different sites. Um, the blue ones are the ones that are currently existing. So we can see they're down there in the English Channel, um, up here just off the coast um, of northern England. Then we have um, yellow areas. These are recommended in Wales. So you can see here in the Irish Sea, there's lots of different areas here recommended um, as special conservation sites, largely because there's an awful lot of dolphin activity in the Irish Sea. And then we've also got these pink areas, which are proposed areas for marine conservation because they will have certain species present. You can see some are out at sea, some are closer to the coast. So if we just whoops, close that down to there. So these, therefore, are these five different things you have to remember in terms of wildlife reserves in the United Kingdom. National parks national nature reserves, sites of special scientific interest, local nature reserves, and marine conservation zones. So, if we just now just finish off, look at advantages and disadvantages 
of conservation in situ. So to begin with, with advantages, we've got conservation is occurring in the natural habitat of the species in question. So therefore it will protect the diversity of that area and it will protect the natural and the cultural heritage of that area and allows management of those areas, very, very careful management to ensure that things don't change too much. It allows sustainable use of the land. So the land is managed and is not exhausted, the sources are not exhausted. Then we have got the very important one of it facilitating scientific research. Very important to be able, for example, to study animal behaviour in the animal's natural habitat. And it will allow improvement and restoration of the area. So all of these things, all of these are great advantages to conservation occurring in situ. However, there are some disadvantages too. First of all, the, the habitats could be too small to ensure survival. They can be fragmented, they can be spread out over an area which doesn't allow animals, for example, to travel from one area to the other. Um, the populations may actually be too small, and so that's already lost its genetic diversity um, before um, the conservation was put into place. And finally, of course, we've got our poachers and our eco-tourists and our poor conditions, which may still be present. So collectively, these disadvantages, though, are outweighed by the advantages of the process. And worst case scenario, if there is real loss of diversity in the area, we can have repopulation. It is possible to actually repopulate, to rebuild biodiversity with careful, careful management. And I hope that was helpful.